that transformed his life. That was me. Okay. He became an avid diver, abandoned his MBA, and became a volunteer and then an animal keeper in the invertebrate house at the Smithsonian National Zoological Park. His passion for coral made him a spokesperson for coral conservation and a beloved teacher, both in the academic and non-academic realms. From 2007, when we first worked together in Puerto Rico on coral, on coral spawning, I kept encouraging him to come to graduate school. However, it took the Smithsonian actually closing the invertebrate house <laughs> for him to come to graduate school and to move west. Um, let's see, it has been a pleasure to have him in our laboratory because Mike is kind, thoughtful, hardworking, and an excellent collaborator, and sometimes even very funny. <laughs> he even has gotten many A pluses during, in his classes during his time here, which I think is a first for, for, for many graduate students. Throughout the years, Mike has been funded by a number of federal and non-federal federal sources, as well as UH and Smithsonian fellowships, and we thank them all for their kind support. Today, you will hear some of the highlights of Mike's thesis work. Mike is the only person I know who has waited and watched for coral spawning every night for two entire summers in a row. He has made some remarkable discoveries that will help us understand coral reproduction here in Hawaii and around the world. It is both with great pleasure and pride that I introduce Mike Henley to you. Thanks, Barry. I'm supposed to start crying, um, I think, after after the talk, but uh, right. So, okay. Uh, thank you everyone for coming today. I'm gonna go ahead and minimize this. I'm gonna switch over and uh, I need to share a screen, don't I? Right. All right, share the screen, minimize that. There's a countdown from five. Can you hear me okay? Is this all right? Okay, great. Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks, Mary, for that kind introduction. You always make me sound better than I think I deserve. Um, uh, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm gonna present a portion of the work I've been working on for this dissertation and uh, mostly gonna center around discussing, discussing coral uh, reproduction in a, in a changing ocean. Um, and of course there are a number of different reefs around the world. There's cold water reefs, there's uh, deep water, there's oyster reefs. We're uh, certainly gonna be talking about the tropical coral reefs of, of the world that are uh, located between these bands of the tropics here. And um, mostly piling up on the Eastern sides of, of continents due to the, uh, you know, the Earth's rotation, the prevailing winds, piling up around oceanic islands and such. Uh, of course, there's always exceptions, but it's these shallow seas, the corals, corals in these shallow seas that we're gonna be talking about today. And I'm not going to get uh, too deep into taxonomy, but just to say that we're, of course, we're here in the phylum Cnidaria, which are the uh, uh, organisms characterized by stinging cells. And of course, that's the, the corals and the sea anemones, the hydrozoans, hydras, if you've ever had the warm pleasure of snuggling up to a Portuguese man of war, or um, the uh, true jellies, uh, the box jellies, I don't rec recommend snuggling those. Actually, just don't snuggle any of these animals at all. It's just ever. Uh, this is, okay, so we're in the class anthozoa here, and this is our true sea anemones, the fascinating serient, the tube anemones, the weird sea pins, but the object of our affection today is going to be the sclerectinians, these stony corals, the hard corals. Those are the ones that are, these are our reef builders, and we're going to center in on the reproduction. So you have two main types of reproduction. You have asexual reproduction, which is um, uh, most common is, of course, a fragmentation. Uh, there's other types of, of asexual reproduction, but fragmentation being the most common, where a uh, piece of coral will get separated from the parent colony, can then grow up a new colony by itself. And this, is, this, but this of course, is clonal reproduction. Uh, in the aquaria, uh, of course, or in the lab, we can replicate this by just gluing animals to rocks. The other type of reproduction, of course, is sexual reproduction, where you have two modes, the brooders and the broadcast spawners. The brooders will internally fertilize, they will then uh, develop those larvae internally, and then they release the larvae that are settlement competent, they're settlement competent larvae. The um, other mode is the broadcast spawners, which just do exactly that. They release their gametes into the water column. Fertilization is external, the larvae drift on the ocean's uh, genetic highways, the currents, 
and um, settle elsewhere. So then within that, you have gonochores and hermaphrodites. The gonochores, of course, being either male or female colonies and hermaphrodites being um, having both sexes, both uh, egg and sperm. Most stony corals are these broadcasting hermaphrodites. And those uh, that we work with are, are the, the broadcasting hermaphrodites that release these egg sperm bundles. So you have a number of, you have a number of eggs surrounding a, a packet of sperm that, bun, that, um, that bundle will then rise to the ocean surface because the eggs are generally um, full of fats, lipids. So that rise to the surface, the, the, the bundle breaks apart um, and then fertilization and so on and so forth. Now, we're looking at this through the lens today, through the lens of climate change. So of course we all know climate change uh, fuels ocean warming. Ocean warming then causes, uh, as, we, as we turn up the temperature on these corals, they will begin to bleach. So this bleaching is of course the loss of those endosymbionts, the symbiotic algae, the unicellular algae, algae that lives within the coral tissues, lives within the animal host, provides it with the majority of its food and the coloration. Of course, when they bleach, those, those endosymbionts get expelled out of the coral, leaving it a pale, pale white. Now in turn, now this has any number of different physiological consequences in terms of reproduction, you're looking at uh, it can manifest in several different ways. It can be where colonies will skip reproduction the next year. You can have a reduction in the size of the eggs or the number of sperm. It can be the quality of the gametes. Uh, they can manifest in reduced fertilization, impacts to larval development and survival, settlement, all that stuff. Some, of course, because there's variation, some species seem to be a little more resilient. And even within species, you find, uh, you know, this coral here has not bleached and this one has. So there's even variation within a species. And when I got into looking, when I got looking into this, um, a lot of the literature surrounded reproduction uh, impact, bleaching um, impacts reproduction, mostly looking at eggs uh, and then, uh, you know, fertilization and, and impacts to the larvae. There are very few studies, at least that I could find, that address the physiology and specifically the motility of the sperm. If sperm was ever investigated, it's usually histologically or through actual counts. And for our lab, uh, Mary's lab, we are, we do quite a bit of cryopreservation. So when we go to freeze the sperm, we just by nature check the motility to begin with because if you're going to, I'm not going to get too deep into cryopreservation, but if you're going to freeze sperm, you want to start off with very high motility because you're naturally going to lose some to the freezing process. So we always just check motility anyway to see if a sample is even worth freezing. And as such, because we're working here this long time, we have this long term data set for a couple of these Hawaiian corals. So here we have Montipera capitata and Lobactus scutaria is also, uh, uh, is, is formerly fungia. Uh, fungus scutaria, the, the, the mushroom coral. Mon Cap uh, Montipera capitata is one of the corals that we're gonna be discussing in depth today. And it's one of the main reef builders in Hawaii. And you see here, going back to 2011, 2012, the, this is uh, uh, mean sperm motility here. You've got you know, upwards of 85, 90% motility. And then 2014 and 2015, we have these back-to-back -back bleaching events, these consecutive bleaching events here uh, in 14 and 15, which where the, the, the motility has just had declined. So now going back to 2017, we're at, we're at now we're two and three years after those bleaching events. Remember, we're trying to cryopreserve the sperm. And so that summer we're looking and, and seeing the motility of Capitata and it was still just really terrible. Below 50% generally is not something we even want to freeze. So we're about midway through the summer, we're sort of like pulling our hair out. What are we gonna, you know, there's nothing to work with here. There's no material to work with. So we started to look at other corals in the bay. And what else can we work with? Can we just freeze something? Uh, and so we came upon Montipera flabellata and Montipera dilatata. And again, we're about midway through, this, through the, the spawning season there. And they didn't release very much material, only a few bundles here and there. But what they did release had really high motility, 80, 90%. What we used to see, what was standard for capitata here. But we weren't sure if we missed the spawn because it only dribbled out a few bundles here and there. There wasn't this big release of, of, of a broadcasting spawn that we were expecting. Um, so we started looking to literature and there just, some work had been done on these corals, but there wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot. Uh, uh, there was, you know, the, the, the posted spawning times were, you know, first quarter moon, second quarter moon, third quarter moon, new, full, whatever. Uh, <laughs> contrast that with Capitata, 
which had a very rich publication history. A lot of people work on it, heavily studied. We knew when to expect it to spawn and we were just not sure about these corals. So, well, that's how I got into this mess. So <laughs> um, for, again, for Montipar cavitata, um, it's one of the most common corals in the bay and actually statewide for that matter. It has this branching, branching formation. Uh, there's this, sort of this whirling foliaceous plate-like formation. Uh, it's found through a broad range of reef habitats from shallow to, to deeper, um, the sedimented areas, not sedimented. It's, it's a very wide, wide range of coral, very plastic. Um, and contrast that with Montipara flabellata and Montipara dilatata, it seems that these, these corals seem to be restricted to more of a narrow, narrow uh, niche. They've, in this uh, shallow waters, exposed to high surge, high wave action, um, very high light, high, high PAR, high UVR uh, exposure. Now you'll see Capitata here is this brown coloration. This, these Flabellata and Dilatata have this really brilliant blue purple coloration. They just, they stick out like a sore thumb as you, as you come across them on the reef. Um, so we were looking at these corals originally. Now there is uh, a little bit of um, uh, uh, uncertainty in, in terms of the taxonomy of whether Flavolata and Dilatata are one species or two, that's beyond the scope of this discussion today. So just, uh, just so you all know, I'm going to be talking about Montipara spa, collectively Flavolata and Dilatata as Montipara spa. And, but you're going to hear me say Montipara spa, you're going to hear me say Flavolata Dilatata, you're going to hear me say the blue corals. Just note that we're contrasting these against this uh, Capitata. So the themes for the dissertation that I've started to put together was again, coral reproduction uh, in climate change. What are some of those mechanisms that might, that these corals might be utilizing or have or not have? And then just a general sort of uh, questions on restoration of what, um, uh, what we can do to help corals persist into the future. And so that sort of started to mold the three different chapters where I looked at the reproductive strategies of these corals, Montipara spa versus Capitata. When are they building their gametes? What's the gamete cycle look like in the reproductive behavior? What is the, uh, what is the physiology, the reproductive physiology between these, these species? And then as Chris Jury's mesocosm experiment was concluding, I took the coral, some of, the, uh, the, of these same corals from his mesocosms and he had tracked the growth of those corals and we put them out onto the reef in a coral tree nursery setup. Unfortunately, I just don't have the time to go into that today. So I'm not gonna be talking about the third piece. I, it's just too long to do, uh, to do these first two portions justice. I, I have to leave this portion out. But if, you, if anybody wants me to talk their ear off about that, I'm happy to at a later date. Okay, so getting to first the reproductive comparison of Montipara spa versus Capitata. When are they, when are they building these egg and sperm and when are they, when are they actually spawning? And before we get there, just get a quick primer on coral reproduction because it never ceases to amaze me that these brainless animals have tuned their reproduction to the same, the same hour, the same short period of time every single year. And to be in the presence of a mass coral spawn, it's, it's, in my slightly biased yet still very humble opinion, it's nature's, nature's finest hour. And they do this by queuing into the long-term annual seasonal fluctuations. So the annual changes in temperature, the annual changes in, uh, in uh, insulation, the amount of sunlight, uh, that's the sort of long-term queue. The short-term queue is this monthly lunar cycle, the new moon, full moon spawners. And then the release of gametes is time after sunset or time before sunrise. And there's other environmental parameters, not going too deep into it, but just they're sessile invertebrates living on the ocean floor. So they can't get up and swim like a fish can to the next neighbor to spawn. So it, they need to synchronize in order to maximize the chance for successful fertilization. So Capitata, again, is very abundant throughout the bay. It's one of the two most common corals in Kaneohe Bay, whereas the blue corals are a little bit more difficult to find. I just swim around and find them. So the way I started this out was I found, I found 10 Montipara spa colonies throughout the bay. And they're again, restricted to that first sort of uh, three to four meters, like uh, uh, 12, 12, 15 ish or so feet. Uh, so I found 10 of those colonies and wherever I found a, a Montipara spa colony, I would tag a Capitata colony right next to it. So controlling for that depth gradient, same temperature, same amount of light, uh, et cetera. And so I would, uh, for then I, I sampled for 10 of the 12 months for, for the histology. And I really need to thank Jackie Padilla-Gimeno here for her 2014 paper, because she had already worked up the annual 
gamete cycle for Capitata. So I was redoing that work using her methods that she, uh, she supplied me, her image J methods, which was made it a great, a very simple comparison, just to see if there was any shifting going on with, with Capitata there and to be able to compare that to, to the blue corals. And then I used those same 10 colonies for histology for the visual observations and the spawning and reproduction work. Plus I supplemented with a few extra corals throughout the bay just to increase the sample size a little bit. So Capitata, we know it's, it's a very reliable spawner. It spawns at, at the new moon typically, usually June and July uh, in those midsummer months, those, those summer months. Uh, with, whereas the blue corals, what we had found in the literature was again, you know, this, it was first quarter, it was third quarter, it was full, new, sometimes, maybe, never, I don't know. Um, and, uh, but we would, prior to a few hours before spawning, we would isolate them in these bins and then look to see if they had spawned. So after two summers of monitoring these corals, this is more or less what we saw from the reproduction. If you see Capitata here on this left side, Capitata, this is, to, to give you an idea, this bin is about 10 to 12 inches in diameter. This is estimated around 8,000 bundles here that is released. And this Capitata spawns as you would expect a broadcasting spawn, a broadcasting coral to, to spawn. It releases this number of, of, of egg sperm bundles in mass and they all they tightly synchronize again around 8,000 or so bundles over two summers of watching these corals I never saw any of these Montipara spa colonies spawn quite like I did the Capitatas to give you an idea this is about as many as I ever saw this is around 400 bundles in this in this container here and that was about as many as we ever ever found uh, seems to be very atypical at least for a broadcast spawning coral um, so Okay, this graph's kind of a mess. Let me, let, me, let me talk you through it here. Okay, so we've got 2018, 2019, and these are the lunar cycles. So you have new moon, full moon, new moon, full moon, and so on and so forth. This is number of colonies on this y-axis, and this is on a per night basis. So the number of colonies spawning on any single, on, on any single night throughout these summer months here. And on the left, you'll notice this is all spawns. So I'm also using this material for all the reproduction work. And especially in 2018, I, I wasn't sure if slash when these corals were gonna spawn. So I, I wanted numbers. I was collecting anything. So I was collecting 10 bundles and we were running motility analysis on it. Uh, so, but could you really, can you really call 10 bundles a spawn? What, what about 30? Sometimes it was 30, sometimes it was 75, sometimes it was 150. Would you really call that a spawn? I, I probably, I wouldn't really, at least for a broadcast spawner. So this first, this, this one here on the left is just if they spawn really at all. And you've got the, again, so the capitals are in the dark, uh, the, um, the dark shapes and then the, um, that's a diamond and the Montipara spas and the, the empty squares. So I can't stress this enough. Nobody does this. Nobody calls 10 bundles of spawn and marks it down. Um, I would venture to say no one calls 400 bundles of spawn, but that's a whole other story here. So what I did was I tried to filter it out into heavy spawn. So there's, you know, the, the light, these light spawns and heavy spawns. And again, this isn't really something that you typically find in the literature. But going back to when they're spawning, trying to maximize the, 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 the probability that they're going to have successful fertilization, that it's a big ocean out there and it's a numbers game. So I try to sort of tease out when these quote heavy spawns were. Now, what does it mean by heavy spawn? Well, basically my, my metric for this was if I walked up to a bin and we saw if it looked similar like this, if it was not practical to sit there and count out several hundred bundles, that's what I would call a quote heavy spawn. That ended up being a, around 200 or more bundles. So anything that was greater than 200, I, I, I called that. Anything that was less, it's not on this chart. So you can see here in 2018 and 19, this is Capitata here in the orange. 2018, I only had 10 colonies of Capitata. So this is five of 10 have spawned on this night. And the next month for Capitata, you have seven of 10 colonies that spawned. 2019, I actually increased the sample size. I, I had, I think 14 or 15, I had 15 colonies of Capitata that next year. Uh, so here in 2019, you've got on this night, there's 10 of 15 spawning and then uh, nine of 15 spawning. But this, this is exactly what you would expect most of these corals to do. They all sort of sync up, they spawn within a couple of days of each other, and then they're done. Now look at these blue corals. They have spread out their reproduction starting, we started monitoring in late May. They didn't start spawning until late June. They would spawn throughout July, August, and into September. 
I only stopped here because I had other things to do. So, but what's really fascinating, at least I think, is that there's the, in any given night throughout these two summers, the total number of corals that would spawn a reasonably large amount was no more than three over both summers, never more than three in a single night. So the way I, so when, when did these corals spawn? The way I approached this question was, if I had a colleague who was from another institution who said, I wanna work on this corals reproduction, I have got, I've got two to three weeks worth of time and funding, when should I show up? I don't. Um, hey, Capitata is a really good coral to work with. Uh, or can you give me six to eight weeks, right? That's about what you're going to need. Depends on how much data you need and what you want to do. I, you know, I, you're going to need, I think, more time. It's very difficult to pin down when I would tell someone in that situation, because that's what we do when we go visiting another institution is you go for two or three weeks and then you come back. So how does this match up with histology? So now what we've done here, so you're seeing a single polyp. This is zoomed in about 200 times. And you're looking at, you're looking at um, this is a, a, a cross-section cut and you're, this is very superficial. So you're looking near the, near the tentacles. In fact, this is cut through the tentacles. So you can see the folds of the tentacles here. And so this is one single polyp. We're gonna zoom down deep into the tissue but we're zoomed out now. So we're at scanning power about 40 times. And again, we have a cross-section here. So deep down in the, into the mesenteries where you find the gonads. So you've got the eggs, the o developing oocytes in pairs oocytes in pairs, and you have the, uh, the spermaries here in pairs and the spermaries here in pairs. So this is this cross section. All I'm trying to do is sort of orient you for this next portion of the talk. If we look at a sagittal cut, so now we're, excuse me, we're doing a sagittal cut here. This is one single polyp and you can see the tentacles, right? Here's the oral disc. And then deep to that alongside the mesenteries are you see the uh, beginnings of a, an oocyte there. And um, here you've got a pair of oocytes and these are the uh, developing spermaries along this line. This uh, Jackie used uh, this Masson trichrome stain and Mary um, suggested I use this Masson trichrome stain. I really, really like this. Uh, it stains the mesoglia of the corals, uh, this sort of bluish purple coloration. The mesoglia is the layer of tissue that gives, it puts the jelly into jellyfish. It's largely acellular tissue, but it makes a nice delineation to, uh, to look through. Okay, so that's just to orient you on in terms of the histology analysis. Now what we're looking at is, so these are oocytes, these are eggs, developing eggs, and this is capitata on the top here. So spawning in July. And, oh, and the way we uh, sort of bin the, the, the gamete sizes is stages one through four. Some people go to stage five. I did one through four. So stage one is a, 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 a it's based on size and appearance, uh, but uh, so stage one is very small, uh, immature, gamete, egg or sperm, and then stage four is, uh, is mature, ready to spawn, uh, ready to spawn gamete. So this is stage four, uh, ready to spawn mature oocytes here in July. And of course, Capitata spawns July, maybe a little bit more in August, but basically by September and October, they're done. So you see right here, this is you know, no more than 50 microns. This is about 400 uh, microns in diameter. This is about 50 micron diameter primor primordial oocyte here in October. Gaining a little bit of size here in November, putting on a little more size in January, and then by the next summer, ready to spawn again. Now let's look at the blue corals. Here we are spawning in July, big 400 or so micron oocyte, stage four oocyte. Here we have stage four in October, same story, stage four in November, same story in January. These corals have these large mature oocytes throughout the entire year. And if we look, on this per month basis, you can see the mean oocyte size here on the y-axis. On the and look at Capitata here, the orange. Here we have June and July. These are the main, two main spawning months for Capitata. This is what we'd expect to see where you have, uh, you have these, um, the, the largest mean oocyte size in these two months. And then after the sudden spawning, drops out in August, no more than 50 on, on average, 50, diameter, uh, 50 micron diameter here in September through October starts to put on size in the winter months and then increase to the uh, summer for spawning again. Now look at the blue corals. Here we are in, here's June, reaching the max mean size here in July and August, drops down a little bit in September, a little bit further in October, but then they maintain this level 
and then increase this little bump up here again in the late spring to the summer months. So they are keeping large oocytes throughout the year, uh, more so, far more than, than, than Capitata, obviously. How does this compare with the sperm? So again, we're spawning here in July, and this is a, this is a nice sort of developed stage four spermary. The, the middle portion here, the lacunae has been filled in by the extension of the sperm tails. So you see, uh, you see um, these ripe spermaries ready to go, spawn in July, done for the end of the summer. And then it's very difficult to find them throughout these uh, um, uh, fall and um, early winter months. So it's basically along this line here where you're gonna see the, those testes start to develop Again, we're October, still very, very early stage one here in November. Same story in January, early, early, early stage. Finally, in, in spring and March, uh, are starting to move from stage one to two. And then from, from there on in April, May, and June, they're going to increase in size. And toward June and July, you'll find them like this again. And this is, um, so this is mirroring the oocyte development. This is commensurate with what, what Jackie found as well when she did the histology on, on Capitata. For Montipara spa here for flabellata and dilatata, so the so that those slides were just capitata. The, all these are the the blue corals. I just got uh, two different examples um, for for all these months for the sperm. So July again, just that 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 late the stage four uh, late stage four here ready to spawn. But also in July, it looks like you got a two moving into a stage three here, sort of a mid stage spermaries. Um, in October, this is a stage three. This is a very this is a nice shot of a stage three. Uh, um, spermary development where you have this lacunae, you can see it's visible here. As that transitions from a three to a four, you'll see this lacunae will fill in with the, uh, as the tails on the spermatocytes elongate and look more like this. So this is stage three, but up here in October, you've also got a stage one. In November, you've got, yeah, we're moving from three, going into four here pretty soon, but there's also a nice shot of stage two. In January, you have the same, same thing. You have these mid-stage spermaries and then an early stage. Mid-stage, this is in March here, mid-stage and early stage in March. So these, uh, these have, similar to, the, similar to the oocytes, they have at least, they have mid-stage sperm in the winter months. So now as we put this all together and look at these frequency charts, you'll see that, so we've got Capitata, on uh, in this uh, orange and brown. So these are the oocytes, and this is the frequency of stages. So the frequency of stage one, two, three, and four. Oocytes here on the left, sperm on the right. So here for Capitata, we're looking at, so this is uh, so April, May. Okay, so May, we have stage, th these are the stage three oocytes that will then develop into stage four oocytes and spawn in June. These, and then in June, this, these stage three eggs will then developed to stage four, and this is what we see spawning in July. And then this leftover little bit here of stage of stage three is typically what we see sort of just dribble out at the, uh, in, in August and not, not spawn very much, but that's sort of what's left over there. For Capitata and the sperm, they match up almost perfectly. They are, they are, they're, they are, um, they're coming into maturity simultaneously, as you would expect a simultaneous hermaphrodite to do. For the blue corals, well, look at their oocytes. So we have July and August here. This is stage three and stage four. Um, so you can see how that pattern would develop uh, from, the, from one month to the next. And then September, October. As you get here into November and the winter months, it, it does decline a little bit, but you still have, of the oocytes that are there, you still have somewhere 30, 30 to 40% stage three and stage four, very large. Uh, very low are oocytes, and they have stage four, uh, three and four year round. And that just doesn't happen with Capitata. For the sperm, there's even a little bit more of a difference here. You, so you see the stage four uh, develops spermaries in uh, July, August, September, and October. So these are ripe uh, sperm that are ready to spawn. Now, when we get into the winter months here, November and on, so you got stage three that are left over, and I, I didn't find any what I would call sort of you know late stage three or stage four spermaries in the winter months. So certainly, they do have a high population of one stage one and easy, very easy to find stage two. You don't have that all at all in Capitata in these months, any of those stage two at all. But these do have at least some of those mid-stage uh, sperm in in those winter months. So. 
for acroporids, so genus Acropora and genus Montipora, the acroporids, a, a sort of quick and dirty field test. If you're not sure if they're if the corals are ready to spawn or if, if a colony is gravid, you can go into the field and crack a branch and look. And we do this all the time with Capitata in the bay here. You can look at a branch and see. And the eggs, if they're ripe and mature and they're colored up, they're nice and pink, you can actually see them with the naked eye and be relatively certain that colony is ready to spawn. Looking back, when I was sampling in the winter months for these uh, these uh, Montipora flavolata and dilatata, I, I I recall thinking, "Am I seeing eggs?" No, I and I, I sort of convinced myself that I wasn't. I thought it was you know bits of skeleton or, or tissue that I was just seeing that it certainly wasn't eggs. And looking back now, it absolutely was. I was absolutely seeing large eggs still in those winter months, and so. For most of these acroporid corals, you know, the, the, the egg maturation is an easy way to tell that. Bring it back to the lab, stain it and section it, it'd be a pain in the butt. But, so anyway, that's where I, um, my internet connection is apparently unstable. No, well, I hope we don't drop out. Okay, so why do we have late stage eggs year round? Is, so is the spawning cycle perpetual? Are they just, are they just ramping up and, and, and spawning a little bit more in these summer months and then have sort of a low grade sort of dribbling out of, of bundles throughout the year? Uh, that might be the case, and if, if, if my sampling just missed all of the stage four, those ripe, mature sperm, then that would make sense. But it doesn't really make sense to me to have an, a mature egg ready to spawn and with no mature sperm. And to my knowledge, they are not parthenogenic. I don't believe they are. So if there is no stage four mature sperm, why keep all of these, why keep a, a dis distribution of, of eggs around? And so this is where I wonder if it might be owing to some of their habitat. So of course, these Montipora flabellata and dilatata, they are endemic to Hawaii. And <clears throat> Hawaii is of course famous for its big surf and big waves in the wintertime. And if these corals, when they inhabit these high energy and surge zones, if this is a period of high fragmentation for them, I wonder if this might be some form of an energy reserve. So after the, if they if they go through periods of high fragmentation in the wintertime, if this these these eggs might be reabsorbed as uh, as an energy source to for to put to push into growth, uh, and that's so this Okubo 2007 here that's what this paper found I believe they were using I believe it was a cropper Formosa and they at, at spawning time they actually had fragmented these corals and saw that that some of those oocytes were reabsorbed uh, instead of spawning them out so um, I don't know that's just a hypothesis at this point but in, it might explain some of why they have these, um, a, what, what are otherwise energetically expensive eggs to keep around and build. And um, so that's where I was sort of landing on that piece. So now we're gonna move over here to the physiology. So going back to looking at those initial motel, motility analyses, analyses and um, sort of building upon those so 2017 um, early observations um, and looking at these different reproductive metrics. So as those corals spawn, as we were sitting there and in, in, um, they were getting them to spawn in the bins, we, uh, through both, uh, again, for those both 18 and 19, 2018, 19, we looked at the number of egg and sperm per bundle, the uh, egg size at spawning, the sperm motility and the associated sperm mitochondrial uh, membrane potential. Uh, and then their fertilization. And these are the different methods that we used to, uh, to, make all these, uh, to, to make all these assessments. So in terms of egg and sperm per bundle, Capitata has more egg and sperm per bundle than the blue corals. And I think probably what, what explains the difference here is the uh, uh, Montipora spa corals, they have, they have small, slightly smaller polyps in terms of just a, a diameter but a, a greater polyp density. There's about three times as many polyps per square centimeter on, on, uh, on the blue corals as there is for Capitata. So Capitata is a slightly, slightly larger polyp, but, but in, in less density. And so I think that probably explains why you have, you know, simply explains why you have more eggs and sperm per bundle than, than the others. In terms of egg volume at spawning, the, um, 
there is, they're, they're very, very similar. They're around 400 microns or so in diameter, but in terms of their volume, there is a, there is a, um, it's, it's, it's a small, but a statistically significant difference uh, in, the, in their volume at spawning time. And I think this is due to the way they, they, they um, Capitata of course peaks at those two months. There's, little vari there's very little variation in their, in their oocytes at spawning time. Whereas because the Montibur flabellata and dilatata are spreading the reproduction out over so many months that there is a, there's a large, there's a large variation in their, in their eggs at spawning time. So I think that's probably what's going on there in terms of this for, but they are both close to around 400 microns when they spawn. So this is, the, the sperm motility is really where we saw the greatest difference uh, going back again to 2017 and for Capitata even before that. So the way we measure sperm motility is with this CASA computer assisted sperm analysis. And all it is, it's a, it's a video program. There's a, a video camera that attaches to the microscope and the software will record a three quarter second video as the sperm moves across the slide. So it's, it's recording its track across the slide. And over here on the left, this is pretty characteristic of how we would see these capitata sperm. The little red dots here, if you can appreciate the size of these little red dots, these are sperm that are just sitting there vibrating. They're not motile at all. And the, the, the sperm that are motile, you can see them on the track here, the, the track that they leave behind. So that's what capitata, what we came to expect out of capitata. For the blue corals, this is frequently how we would see their motility just really high, really 80, 90% motility, very, very consistently. And of course, driving that motility is the mitochondria. And so sperm are, they're relatively, they're not, they're not a very, very complex cell, but they are, there's, there's great diversity across taxa, uh, but there's, so there's the head, which contains the DNA. There's the the midpiece, which is where you find the mitochondria, and then the flagella is the tail that provides the propulsion. And uh, the, the source of their power is, is, of course, the mitochondria. And this was every biology student's worst nightmare the day the mitochondria was no longer the powerhouse of the cell and became the cycle which shall not be named. But the, uh, yeah, okay, it's the Krebs cycle. Uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna go into a long form dissertation format about the Krebs cycle, just to note that because of this, this ATP generation, there is this pH gradient in this intermembrane space of the mitochondria. And because there is that pH gradient, we can, we can measure a membrane potential. And the membrane potential uh, due to this pH gradient is what we're, we were using as a proxy for mitochondrial health. And the way we do that is there is a, a particular stain, this JC1 stain that we will put in the sperm sample and if there is a high membrane potential, this stain will cluster and fluoresce orange on a flow cytometer. If there is a low potential, the this, this stain does not cluster and it fluoresces green on the flow cytometer. And again, we were using this as a proxy for the mitochondrial integrity. So when we put all of this together, you have motility here. So this is percent sperm motility. This is percent of sperm with a high membrane potential, high mitochondrial membrane potential. And then we have percent fertilization. 2018 is the solid bars. 2019 are the striped bars. And of course, capitata in the orange and the blue corals in the blue. So for both summers, you have, you have Montipora, uh, Montipora spa corals are really high motility and corresponding very, very high uh, percentage of sperm with a high membrane potential. Think back now to that 2017 and beyond where we had, uh, we had Capitata and during the, the, during the years of the bleaching in 2014, 2015, the motility had dropped below 50%. And here we are in 2018, we are now, what, four, three and four years removed from those bleaching events. And we still have overall total motility below 50% and a corresponding low mitochondrial membrane potential. So it appears that these corals, at least in terms of their motility, this recovery time, as you can see here in 2019, finally started to pick up, getting creeping up above 60%, but it's still a far cry away from the 85, 90% that we saw at pre-bleaching. So 
Unfortunately, we do not have long-term records for the blue coral, so I don't have anything to compare it to um, in, in, like we do for Capitata. Uh, and that goes for fertilization as well. Fertilization for, for Montebra flabellata and dilatata were about you know, the same, around 60 or so percent both, both years. For Capitata, you might see here, you have a relatively, you have a higher fertilization percent than in, in 2019, which seems to be opposite the motility. So you had low motility and then higher motility, and then the, the fertilization actually dropped from year to year. I think what we're having here is this is the way we do, we've, uh, we've typically done the fertilization assays. So we take bundle bundle crosses, so bundles from uh, from two spawning corals, put them in a scent vial in about five mils of water uh, and let them sit for, so the, wait till the bundles break apart, then they sit for about an hour and then we assess for fertilization for the cleavage of the eggs about three hours after that. So basically with in vitro fertilization and fresh sperm, you could probably get a, a reasonably high fertilization um, it, with even low motility, 10, 20% might, might yield a, a uh, a, a high fertilization if you have a, an appropriate sperm egg ratio. So I think to truly test the impacts of motility on fertilization, we would need to change up these methods a little bit, either dilute it sooner or, um, or, or some other sort of uh, experimental setup. So putting this all together, we are, and going back to the, uh, the spawning times, we have Capitata, which has a very tightly coupled uh, uh, reproduction with you know high, high synchronization and these blue corals are spreading the reproduction out over several months uh, but what really is uh, is interesting to me is how asynchronous they are you know they not it's it's the it's a low number of vol uh, the, the low volume of bundles they're releasing but also that extended time it just and and, and low number of corals spawning on any given night seems incongruous to the goal of successful fertilization to me um, in terms of the reproductive impact, the sperm motility was what we saw was the was the most impacted over over these over this time, uh, with Capitata lagging, at least in recovery, what seems to be at least four, maybe even five years later, uh, and um, we don't have the records for the blue corals. So they you know they if they were impacted, uh, they either recovered very quickly or they may have not been impacted you know, at all. And so what I, what I think, to try to explain some of this, what, what may be happening, so now I'll sort of get into the area of, of hypothesis of what, what I think may be going on with these corals here is that you have um, the corals that live in the shallow seas will have their now own natural sunblock, right? Because UV damages DNA, ultraviolet radiation will, will damage DNA. So they produce their own sunblock. For Capitata and corals similar to it, this, uh, natural sunscreen comes from their symbionts. So they're the same symbiotic algae that are gone when they're bleaching and provide them with food, also produce these microsporin-like amino acids, these MAAs, it's produced by their symbionts. And these corals will use that as a, as a UV protectant. For the blue corals, and I, I really have to thank Angela Richards for, this, uh, for her discussions on this. She did her work on, on Montipera on, on Montipera flavolata, and it's, the that dark purple bluish coloration is produced by the chromoproteins in the, in the coral itself. So Capitata is getting its UV protection from byproducts from the symbionts, whereas these blue corals, and this is what gives them this bluish purple coloration, are these chromoproteins which are produced by the coral itself. And if you can see in this in the in the picture here, this coral has actually turned this pastel Easter purple color, uh, and because this coral is bleached. And then the dark portions here in the middle is where this tissue has receded, it's died off, and it's been colonized by diatoms and algae and other organisms. So this is another thing with these corals is that these blue corals seem to be canaries in the coal mine on, on, uh, with temp temperature sen sensitivity. They're often some of the ones we see bleach very quickly and also and will, will, uh, they're, they're sensitive to mortality, whereas Capitata, it might bleach, but it also has been shown to increase heterotrophic feeding to help maybe push it through those, those, uh, those temperature disturbance times. So, you know, are we looking at a life history trade-off here with these corals? But when Capitata bleaches, is it losing this UVR protection? So if it's lost that, if it bleaches and that, 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 that temperature 
anomaly stays is, is sustained for a long time. So they stay bleached a long time. They don't recover those symbionts. Are they then exposed to an increased uh, ultraviolet radiation, which might be damaging some of the of the, the either the mitochondria or these sperm stem cells, leading to a long term uh, long term cellular damage? Whereas if the blue corals, if they survive, they don't die. Are they are they maintaining some of that UVR protection, which then protects some of that uh, some of those cells uh, via these chromoproteins, which then protects the DNA from long-term damage? Um, I don't know. Again, this is just a hypothesized mechanism been kicking around, and somewhere I'd like to see some of this work go next. So, with that, I need to thank first and foremost my my committee. Uh, doctors Mary Hagedorn, Cindy Hunter, Rob Tunin, Judy Lemus, and Bob Thompson. Uh, these people, I, I'm, I'm convinced, need to be uh, sainted or knighted or something because they've been bearing the brunt of my long-form, multi-compound sentences over the last, you know, nine or so months. And you know, this is a writing style. It's it's a useless superpower I have that I I, I was taught by my mother who taught me how to write. Um, but you know, I, it's a useless superpower that I can turn an entire paragraph or more into one sentence that's technically grammatically correct. But as I've been told, most people don't want to read that much in one single sentence. And these have been no. But seriously, your constructive criticism and your encouragement over the last several years has been uh, so. Thank you all very much for that. Um, the lab, my lab mates, um, uh, Nick. Thank you so much for you know. Well, you get everything, but getting the costs up and running. Um, John, for your patience with the flow cytometer. Jess, your hours of stats, thank you. Uh, Claire is everyone's left and, and right arm, and, and Riley and Chris, thank you all so much. Um, this doesn't happen in a vacuum. The original uh, uh, authors of the Coolia Grant, uh, the HIMB Scholarship Committee, the SOAS Evans Fellowship, the Fonz Conservation uh, Grant Committee, the, the Volgenaus, Lou Chosun, and Bob and Tammy, if you were able to tune in tonight. Um, your your donations are just humbling. Um, I'll be with you in a second. <laughs> this journey started at the zoo many full and new moons ago with the best co-workers I have ever had. And um, <sighs> this one day, Mary Hagedorn came into the invertebrate exhibit and told us that she was working on corals. And there was this young Aquarius there, chomping at the bit to do field work. And it was Alan who fostered that relationship and really, um, he helped push my career forward. And Tammy and Donna and Michael and our million volunteers at that time uh, were also equally as supportive. And Ed Peronikowski behind him, my best friend, Ryan Valdez, who I guess we share a love of 80s hair bands, uh, he saw me in Hawaii eventually, and he was right. Um, Helen Moore and Lois Phoebus took a, 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 a risk on a phone call from a kid from Oklahoma who got his first internship at the zoo, and this is what it turned into, and Doug and Lori and the SI diving program. When, when we shut the exhibit down, I lost a little piece of me, um, but it was, it was time to leave, and when I got here, the Hawaii unit was was equally as wonderful. Uh, so thank you to Jason and Dave for all of your help with the, the diving uh, materials and uh, the HIMB facilities and staff. Drew always had a boat ready for me to go. All those nights were watching spawning um, and the education department, Mark, Leon, Leah, everyone up there. Leon, you've been a great companion over the last couple of years uh, and Mark equally as well. Derek, uh, you're the best co-teaching buddy I think I've ever had at the Pacific America Foundation, along with Urban Doug. Thank you so much. Um, you've become a great friend. And the, US, the UH Histology Histocore, they did all those wonderful slides, Miyoko and, and Kristen there. Um, they, they, it made it very easy to analyze. And Jackie offering up her help, along with Angela and her discussions, and Beth, the best spawning, uh, coral spawning buddy ever. Um, Kathy, thank you so much for all of your help with the measurements of the corals. I'll talk to you about the coral trees later uh, and let you know what on there and Catherine as well. Um, Dan, I'm so glad you came and spent your summer here and learned the ways of the coral. I hope you enjoyed it. I loved hanging out with you. It was time I'll always treasure. <sighs> and then there's Mari, who <laughs> was a, uh, 
a student in my after school class who was looking for an internship, it just happened to be looking for an intern that summer. I told her what was involved uh, and she gave up two of her summers in high school. All those nights you saw spawning when we were looking at staring at rocks in bins, Mari was alongside of me. And I entrusted her with a large portion of the data collection of my dissertation. I placed in the hands of a high school student because I knew she could do it. And this work is as much your accomplishment as is mine. So thank you. And then there's my family who's always, I'm done, I'm done, this is the last slide, I promise. Who's been love and support uh, in every crazy thing I've ever done. And along the way, there's always been Abby. Who, when I was certain I wasn't gonna be able to do this, she always told me I could and reassured me. And sometimes she was even able, even able to channel my dad who would say, Michael, do something, even if it's wrong. And so I, I did. And with that, I really am done this time. And that I'm in a total shape to take questions now, I will. 